Well, Lola, my personal purpose statement is this. To inspire, impact, empower, and help transform those in, in and out of the space that I occupy. If you have additional time after we get off the elevator, I can share with you how I do that. Each one of you all should have your own personal purpose statement or your elevator pitch because you may only get one opportunity to make an impact wherever you are and you may not have enough time, Bobby, to do it. Would you agree? All right, Jim Yeah, let's proceed. Alpha. I tried to Google Alpha last night and I couldn't find it. Why? Because I had P.H. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, this is a bogus organization. Because <laughs> I can't find anything on Google, and Google is the map. That's the I can't find anything on Google regarding this alpha organization. And I really wanted to get the logo on my slide. So I went back to my confirmation letter, it said, you idiot. <laughs> it's not spelled that. It's out for. It your theme, your power to influence change. I was going to ask a couple of people to give me your, or give me their elevator pitch. In fact, I'm going to do it just for a couple of folks. And I'm standing right in front of you. <laughs> right now. In the span of 31 seconds, I'll give you a little bit more. I would like to know your name, I would like to know if you're a follower or a leader, and I would like to know what you do. Hello, my name is Mark Johnson, and can you tell me a little bit about yourself, madam, please? Would you please stand up? This is called experiential. This is called participation. Come up here. <coughs> Base your peers. Now, why don't you go ahead and share with them what you do in 31 seconds. Hi, my name is Lisa Rivera. The leader and the community share a, a 
common purpose to develop and provide the drive, the authority and commitment to undertake projects, and that no matter where you are or where you work. A leader should understand what their purpose is. Now, the question is, what is purpose? I like this. The purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. That's mine. I came up with that. Actually, actually it was someone else's, and I gave him credit. I think his name was Robert Byrne. I gave him credit for it, and when I was looking for it last night, I found out that I didn't quote it correctly, that I added something else to it. So it wasn't Robert Burns, it's actually mine. <laughs> <laughs> so the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. What makes a good leader? Knowing his or her life's purpose. If I were to ask you all, any individual here, excuse me, what is your purpose? You would likely look at me dumbfounded because no one would have asked you such a question. And when I was in California going through the training, that was the question we were asked. And I'm like, no one ever asked me that question before. But then I remembered Rick Warren had a book called The Purpose Driven Life. And in The Purpose Driven Life, he talks about purpose. He says our first purpose is to worship God or whatever you perceive God to be. But our second purpose is to determine what is it that we were placed on this planet, on earth, to do that we, individually, do well. Next. Without purpose, we have no meaning. When I talk to the inmates, when I talk to some random kid, when I talk to an adult, I explain to them this. One fact. If you have no purpose, you have no intention. If you have no intention, then what is your meaning for existence? This is information that children need to understand. So I need for you all to get this, because then you all become the disciples where you go back into your workplace and you ask your children or your friends who don't know, what is your purpose? Yes. How do we find our purpose is the question that will come up. It's all connected to dots. Now one dot that's not connected is my markers for the board. Now someone was supposed to connect that dot and bring me a marker so I can draw my pyramid. So since I don't have the marker to do it, I have to improvise. Connecting the dots. Imagine, if you will, a pyramid. At the foundation of the pyramid, the very bottom of the pyramid, is the word passion. Passion is what fuels, fuels, I'm from Tennessee, my tongue is tied. <laughs> passion fuels our purpose. Now this is not something that you can just randomly do unless you know for sure that this is what you're supposed to do. Go back to when you were a child and think about those things you enjoyed doing that made the hair rise on the back of your neck. That gave you goose pimples when you thought about it that made you smile so uncontrollably that your face hurt. That made you happy. That made your heart sing. That's passion. My standing in front of you all and running my mouth is my passion. <laughs> and as you see, I just do it over the top because I enjoy doing it. And sometimes I've got to tone myself down. <laughs> Once you understand the things that you enjoy doing, then you're going to use those characteristics, those things that you enjoy, and then you're going to try to develop a thing 
You see, I didn't know that they called me motor mouth when I was a child. I had no idea. Went home. My father died in 2008 of urinary bladder cancer. And while I was there, I spent three weeks in the hospice with him overnight. Watched him take his last breath. His brother, my uncle, was also in the hospital. And when I stepped into his room, he said, there's motor mouth. And I looked at him. I said, Motor Mouth? Where did you get that from? Went to my mother's home. These three old ladies stepped in the door to give condolences because my father had then passed away. The oldest of the three ladies, she looked at me and said, There's Motor Mouth. I looked in the kitchen. I didn't think she was talking to me. And I said, Excuse me, she said, When you are a young boy, you would run your mouth so much, we would have to tell you to shut up. <laughs> and you would run your mouth again and run away. My passion. We developed a thing. What did some of the dots have in common? That's what we're looking for. There's a thing. Were there any dominant adjective or action verbs contained within it? Next. Once we understand and we connect the dots, we blend in and we try to create a theme, that then gives us an idea. It helps us, it assists us, it helps develop, bring together, nurture, inspire, and create what the purpose is. I like using this as an example. SEAL Team 6. SEAL Team 6 took out Osama bin Laden. I assure you that they could not have achieved that objective if they were not passionate about what they did. Because they do what we can't do. They go where we can't go. And they deliver downrange what we cannot deliver. I assure you, one of those members on SEAL Team 6 or any part of that organization was a boy scout growing up. He may even became an Eagle Scout as he was growing up. And then for some reason, the sense of purpose started to come out and overflow, and he decided he wants to join the Army. The other guy was a surfer. Boy, loved to surf. He loved to surf. He loved that water. All right? He swam like a fish. He's now an adult. He loves adventure. The other kid, he was a deer hunter. All right, he loved hunting. But he also loved to fix little animal, animals up when they were wounded. So he becomes the medic. Someone else likes to break things up, my man. He likes to tear them up and break them up. So he becomes EOD, explosive ordinance. So you see how you take their background, you take the thing, you connect the dots, and this gives us insight into our purpose. After you understand what your purpose is, now we're looking at what dream is it that we want to create. In this room, there are individuals with ideas, with dreams of things that they want to do. People they want to help. Things they want to create. Desiring a change, desiring a home. One of my dreams and vision was to create an anti-bullying presentation that I could present as a faith-based when any school assembly or even to adults. That's part of my passion. So after I understood my passion, I understood my purpose was to inspire, impact, empower, and help transform those in and out of the space that I occupy. Now, how am I going to do that? I'm going to create an anti-bully presentation. My dream. After I have determined what my dream is, 
I then have to determine what projects are going to help me achieve that. Now understand this, ladies and gentlemen. These are the most basic attributes of a leader or a good follower because they are self-directing and they understand the concept, maybe not exactly as I have presented it to you all, but inherently in their DNA, they understand that in order to be a fast charger and a mover, that I must be self-directed. So, I developed the project. Well, milestones, objectives, intentions, goals, vision, they have to be measurable. I dress up like an inmate. I wear orange jumpsuit, leg irons, belly chain handcuffs. I got a gold grill I put on and a dreadlock wig. And when I step into that school, the resource officers bring me in shackles, and I come in there, and they sit me in a chair in front of the students. And I sit there with my shady glasses on so they can't see my eyes. And then I began to talk about my becoming a victim of a bullying incident, and I shot the person who bullied me. And through my dramatization, I used that hook to bring them in, and they'd come out of the jumpsuit and go into my presentation. That was part of my dream, so I knew the project had to be done in order to make this happen. And the same concept is used for anything you want to create. Schedule for completion, very important. Establish the deadline, follow up on all projects. Remember this, that which remains unmonitored remains undone. As a leader and even as a follower, that is so important in ensuring the success of whatever it is that we are entrusted with emboldened to supervise. That which remains unmonitored remains undone. You must schedule it. You must see it in order to ensure that it is carried out to completion. <coughs> After that's done, and this becomes the tip of the pyramid, Manifestation. Manifestation is the creation of whatever it is that you wanted to create. It is where your dream comes true. As a follower, as a father, as a mother, as a leader, you should be developing such characteristics within your people. This is not just a basic tool for leaders, but this is a basic tool for human beings. The dream is complete. What happens next? Do we continue the purpose? Do we redefine what we want the purpose to be? Do we reconstruct or do we create another purpose? At the top of this, how many of you all are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Raise your hands high. Very good. At the top of the pyramid, the tip, is self-actualization. And that's when you have achieved whatever you need to achieve because you have built from the ground up to this level. And once you have self-actualized or created the dream or manifested the dream, then it's time to do something else or continue doing what you were doing. Our leaders born of hate. What do you think, Nathan? You think they can be made? Anyone else have an idea they'd like to share? Please don't be shy. I think they're developed. You think they're developed, made? Mm -hmm. Yes, you. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Terry. Terry, do you think leaders are born or made? combination of both. But I guarantee, if you were to Google it, you'll find philosophies and opinions on both sides. People come up with statistics and other information that will verify, make credible what they're saying. This is the most foundational aspect of becoming a leader, a leader and that is knowledge. Knowledge of oneself, others, the organization, or the competition. Of self. 
You as a leader or even as a follower should know what your weaknesses are. In too many companies and organizations, even in the military, schools, churches, etc., there are individuals who are in positions of leadership who don't really know themselves. They think they got it all figured out, but they really don't. A leader is a constant teacher. They are a constant student of learning, and that is the same for a follower. Knowing others, I must know the idiosyncrasies or the characteristics of those individuals that I supervise or lead. But even as a follower, I must know the characteristics or idiosyncrasies of those individuals next to me, my peers. Because if my peer is weak, I must know that my peer is weak. And if I have to do something, I may not want that peer working with me. Because that peer is going to pull me down. A follower and leader know the idiosyncrasies of others. Know the organization. You must know the organization that you're working for. The ethos, the vision, the mission. Only then can you function at a greater level and be on purpose. How can you work within an organization and you don't understand the organization's mission or vision? How can you execute as a follower or leader? The leader creates the vision, which brings the followers in. In the military, we always call it, say, know the enemy. Because when you know the enemy or the competition, you know where they're coming from. You know what they're doing. You can anticipate their every move. I call it the 360 approach. That is levitating above the situation, the organization, the person, and looking at them from the top down. You see, if I use the 360 approach and I'm talking to a fella, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, this guy talks too much slang. What is he saying? The eubonics are deep. I don't understand. I'm 57 years old. I don't understand what you're saying, man. But then when I understand that he comes from the hood, or from deep in the barrio, or wherever he comes from, I know that this is the manner in which he communicates. And understanding the manner in which he communicates and how he behaves empowers me. Because when I know you, I know you almost better than you know yourself. So my response is to you, my friend. What's your name? I'm pointing at you and looking at you, man. What's your name? Daniel. Daniel? Therefore, if I know you, Daniel, then I am empowered, and I can either lead you, Daniel, or as your peer and a follower of the organization, I can help you negotiate the tough waters. Situational leadership is very important. I was telling Santiago this morning, I had to get up early and include this in my slideshow. My slideshow was complete last time. But, <laughs> the agenda states, where is it? I saw it. Situational leadership somewhere was on here, I thought. Yes, true visionary and purposeful leaders lead by example and employ situational leadership. And I realized I didn't have nothing in there about situational leadership. And somebody out there with a swift mind, they're going to say, that man ain't got nothing there about situational leadership. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're going to write that on the survey, he did not discuss situational leadership. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I couldn't have that happen, man. I had to come back into the group. I got up this morning, I started looking at it. Because I understand situational leadership, and it is exactly what the state. There are different styles of leadership. I want you all to know. There are many. Too many to even bring up. So if you all see a flaw in this, it's because I haphazardly put it together very quickly. Situation leadership states this one point. Every person cannot be led the same way. Every person cannot be led the same way. One individual may have all the skills and tools necessary to execute what needs to be executed. 
as a leader, I cannot use an autocratic standpoint. I don't even know why, why I even broke down like that. See, that's what happens when you wait till the last minute. All the crap. Let's move to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about all the crap real quick. All the crap is the one who's going to put his thumb on top of your head. He's going to micromanage you to death. And you don't need to be micromanaged. Because you know what you got to do. Man, if you just... Leave me alone and let me take care of the business. I know what I got to do. Now, on the other hand, you have someone else, he's a slug, or she's a slug. Now, a slug is an unmotivated individual working in the workplace who you got to watch because they're not competent, they're not motivated, and they don't care. They prefer to gossip about what's going on versus trying to get the job done. The bureaucratic leadership style, by the book, you all see this right there yourselves. I'm not going to read all this for you. Would you all agree with the characteristic of the bureaucratic leader? Mm -hmm. Anyone here disagree? Mm -hmm. That's a very strong consensus. Okay, very good. <laughs> Anything. Sometimes you got to follow, baby. 
You understand what I'm saying? You got to follow. Iron Mike is a bronze statue down in Fort Benning, Georgia at the infantry school. It's a bronze statue of an infantryman leaning forward with a rifle. And the inscription for the base of that statue is this thing. Lean, follow, or get the hell out of the way. Lean, follow, or get the hell out of the way. That on the inscription at the base of that statue. And when you think about it, either you're going to be a good leader, or you're going to be a good follower. But you can't not contribute to the process. Ah, continue. <laughs> continue. Continue. Ha. I like this right here. The same attributes that make a good follower, it simply makes a good leader. A friend of mine is attending FSU. I met him in 2006 when I was attending a first step of speakers conference in Los Angeles. 19 years old. He's making over $100,000 now. He's doing quite well. He's working on his third master's degree. And this master's degree that he's working on is called followership. And I found that very interesting. Followership. I said, okay, I know what a follower is. But what is followership? Well, followership is the understanding of what it makes to be a good follower in the organization. The same thing that it takes to be a good leader. Judgment. A good follower, as a good leader, you must know if your leader is competent enough to lead you. As a follower, you must be competent. Because if you are not competent, then how do you know if your leader is competent and he's leading you in the right direction? Work at it. Good followers are good leaders. But then good leaders are as well. They're good workers. Look at it. Motivated. Head kids in the detail. They don't go to sleep in the classroom. Leaders have a responsibility to create an environment that permits these qualities to thrive. Next. Competence. If you don't know what you're doing, you better find out. And if you're the leader, you better find out who knows what they're doing and who does not. Because as the leader of your organization, if your people are not competent, it is your fault as the leader. But as a follower, if you are not competent about what you're doing, then that's your fault. Because eventually you will fall on your sword. How are we looking, Michelle? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> Honestly. Hey, some people are like lap dogs. They're the yes man and the yes woman. Yes, boss, yes. Knowing that what you are saying yes to is not correct. Bobby, you know it's wrong. You sit up and you look at Mark, you say, Mark, that ain't right. You say that in your mind. That's not going to work. Bobby will do one of two things. Bobby's going to wait till the appropriate time, pull me to the side and say, hey, look, Mark, I got something I want to share with you. Please take no offense. It's all about your ability to communicate and how you communicate. I think you need to look at it this way. And me being a good leader, I'm going to say, Bobby, you're absolutely correct. Or, Bobby can be the lap dog. Yeah, Mark, that's a good idea. That's a real good idea. You know, it's good to wait up, that that's the worst idea in the world. We don't want to surround ourselves with people like that. We want to surround ourselves with people who's going to give it to us in the raw. Forgive me, sometimes I draw when I speak, and I spray. You know, I'm not the back up front, so I don't get I think I hit them with our radio, okay? Go. <laughs> Courage. This is probably one of the most important aspects of a good follower, but also of a good leader. This is in your home. This is in your church. This is in your community. This is as a human being. Call it like it is. 
discretion. Some people just can't keep their mouths shut. <laughs> I'm talking about the perpetual gospel going on work. That word they're talking about, they're talking about that, has nothing to do with their job. They're over there by the coffee, by the water. They're up there just over there all the time. It's like, God, man, you just had 10 minutes over there, now you're back over there again. I mean, are you getting any work done? Talking about Jim, Jane, and Bob. Did Jim and Bob are dating her? What did that do with the job? Please. <laughs> Loyalty. We got to have it. You got to trust those people that you work with. And they've got to trust you. And when they know you got their back, they got your back. Bottom line. If you're around a disloyal person, you need to limit your interaction with such a person. They will bring you down. The leader will follow. Ego management. That's a killer right there. That is a killer. Don't step on no egos, because they're going to scream, they're going to shout. Come on. Keep the ego in check. The only way you're going to learn, you're going to be able to get along with everybody, is to keep that ego in check and be open minded Thank you. The application of everything that I just said can be used in the realm of leadership as a follower, as a father, as a mother. If you're not developing your children or those around you, then you're not applying that which you have been gifted, which you've been blessed to apply and share. Yesterday I spoke at a GED graduation for a group of juveniles incarcerated at the Sumter Correctional Institution in Sumter County. And when I talk to them, I share with them the importance of some of these same principles I just share with you all. They're universal. You will have the opportunity to talk with someone one day and ask them, what is your purpose? And they will tell you, I don't know what my purpose is. And then you'll ask them, what are you passionate about? And you will build your construct from there, sharing something with them that they will benefit from. Anybody have any questions? About anything? I do. What, yes. if, what if they don't know what they're passionate about? Tell them to think about it. Because now they're an adult, so... As children, when we grow up, we love to paint. We love to feed the paint. Stick our feet in the paint and make all kind of funny stuff with all kind of colors. I want to be a painter when I get older. But as they get older, someone tells them, you don't want to be a painter because you don't make money as a painter. So as an adult, we lose all those stimuli that connected our passion. It takes time. You have to think about it. Unless you know you want to be an ophthalmologist or urologist and you shoot straight ahead. But most people, you have to just stop, meditate, and think about it. Because there's something you were passionate about. It's been all blocked, it has to be unclawed. Anybody else? You are wonderful, man. <laughs> I love you all here. Number one, it could only be one person in here, and I've been sad. But if there's only one person in here, then my message is for that one person. And that's the way that I roll. If only one person in here was able to understand my message, then I have fulfilled my purpose. Thank you all.